So last time y'all really seemed to enjoy me answering your questions on camera. So we're doing that again today. That's coming up. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Reeks. This is Weaver Leather Supply. Today, we're gonna be answering your questions. We're, we did this before, you seem to really enjoy it. So we're gonna be answering the questions that you left in the comments section of the, the videos that we've done over the last couple of months. So let's go ahead and jump in. We've got our first one here. I gotta get my spectacles on. Uh, let's see, Hillbilly Dan 4721 said, okay, I've got a newbie question. What purpose does cutting in the decorative lines in the leather serve and is there another step to add the 3D look? So with your first question, the, uh, the decorative cuts. So the primary thing that those are gonna do is add flow. Anytime you're creating any kind of piece of artwork and, and make no mistake, leather work is artwork. You wanna pull the, the viewer's eye. If you look at any of the master's works from the Renaissance, it's naturally gonna pull your eye through the painting even if you don't realize it's happening. And that's exactly what the decorative cuts are supposed to do. If it's a petal, then it's gonna be pulling your eye to the center. If it's a vine work, it's gonna be pulling your eye down and around. The whole idea here is that we're pulling the viewer's eye through the piece and to a small extent, controlling where their eye goes. Now, as far as adding the 3D look to the piece, there's a couple of things there that you can mean. The first one would could just mean, how do I get a lot of depth out of my tooling? Well, that's gonna be the tools that you use. Um, the bevels are gonna have a lot to do with that. So like a traditional bevel's really gonna push the leather away from the subject. So if this is the edge of a pedal, that traditional bevel is gonna push it away. A steep edge bevel is really gonna drive straight down and create that crisp edge. So there's a couple of different ways that we can do that. It's too much to get into here, but if you're just talking about tooling, then we're looking at, at stamps and that kind of thing. The other thing that you might be talking about would be embossing. And there's a lot of great videos out there on how to do embossing. Uh, essentially what we're doing with that is we're stretching the leather and backfilling it so it will hold its shape and that's how you get that lift and that rise. In fact, the, the dragon that's back here, the purple one, her name's Jewel, she's a good example of that. That's a single piece of leather, and it's really stretched out so that you can see the shape of the body. That's called embossing. So those would be the ways that you can add the 3D-ness that you asked about to a leather piece. So our next question comes from Carl the Biker Guy 3873. And it says, may I ask why acrylic paint instead of colored dye? And this was from the Daisy video that we did a little while back. Essentially, it comes down to a few things. One, paint is more forgiving than dye. And that's because it's not 100% permanent until you seal it and lock it in. The dye really soaks down into the leather and permanently changes the color of the leather, where the paint tends to sit on the top. And with it being a water-based paint like acrylic is, a lot of times if you need to, you can gently remove that, that paint from the leather if you make a mistake with a look like a damp Q-tip can do that for you. Not always, but a lot of times. The other thing, um, paint tends to be a lot easier to blend. And I mean a lot easier to blend. So if you're trying to create variegations on a petal or something like that, Paint's definitely the way to go because the blending opportunities. And the thinner the paint, the easier it is to blend. So if you've got Angelus, they have a, a thinner that's called Too Thin. You really have to play with it and kind of get a feel for what you like to work with. But the thinner the paint, the easier it is to blend. Good question though. So our next question is from Sandy Masquith, M-A-S-Q-U-I-T-H. I hope I got that right. I apologize if I, if I pronounced it wrong. It says, question on the pyrography. This was on the journal that we did, uh, it was a fantasy journal. We etched the design into the cover with a pyrography kit. How wet is the leather in your video? Was that a five minute soak or a 30 minute soak? I'm having trouble with that in my wet molding. I think I need to soak way more than 15 minutes. I've been doing, how do you judge when to stop soaking? My question to you would be, what do you mean by soaking? Are we taking that leather and setting it in a tub of water and letting it soak for five minutes or 30 minutes? Or are you talking about after you dampen it, you set it aside and let that water soak into the leather? So there's two different ways that could go and I wanna address both of them because they're, they're very, very different. 
Um, we're actually going to be doing a video on how to case leather in the upcoming weeks, and we're going to address this exact thing. So the first thing I would say to you is if we're talking about that first scenario where we're literally taking the leather and soaking it in water, there's only two ways that I would do that. The first one is if you're wet molding, yeah, you're going to need to soak it for a little while, but we're talking like seconds not minutes. So we're going to submerge that in the water and we're going to let some of the bubbles come out of it. Then we're going to take it aside and let the moisture kind of equally distribute through the leather. The only other scenario where I would submerge it in water is if I have a huge tooling pattern that I'm going to be working on and I don't want to keep adding water to it because a lot of times it'll, the leather will swell like a sponge and you'll use, you'll lose some of that detail that you've created. So really the only way I would ever submerge it is I would put it in the water and right back out. We're talking two seconds, three seconds, five seconds, something like that. Then I'm gonna take that leather, I'm gonna set it aside and let the water soak into it really good and let some of it evaporate off. Now with that technique, you can take it and put it in a plastic bag and set it in the refrigerator and let it soak for 24 hours in the refrigerator. And again, we're letting the water soak in, not soaking it in the water. So that's scenario one, submerging it. The other scenario is if you're talking about letting the water soak into it, that's really going to depend on how much water you applied to it. If we're talking about like a spray bottle where it really just gets the top of it, and that's the technique I use a lot, it's a few minutes, like two to 10 minutes, it can be ready to go. If we're talking about with a sponge, a sponge tends to dump a lot more water on it than what a spray bottle would. You're gonna have a little bit more of a rest time. And by rest, I mean, you just set it aside, let the water soak in, let it come back to its normal color. So that could be five, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. It just depends on the moisture level in the air, how much air movement you have in the room. There's a lot of factors there. Two of the key factors that you can look for on that is it almost back to the original color? It has, it, we want kind of a honey or caramel color to it, but almost back to the original color that it was at. The other one is, does it feel cool to the touch? If it's like, if you can touch it and it feels wet, you still need to let it soak for, or not soak, rest for a little while. Good question though. So the next question comes from my buddy, Dave Arooney, 7763. He's my buddy from the, uh, the Chuck Dorsett live videos that happen every other week on uh, YouTube. He does a live video where he talks to everybody, kind of gives everybody an update. And we've chatted on there in the chat window before. Uh, he says, great idea for a video. This was on the pyrography one. So great idea for a video. I wasn't a big fan of the Antiques Roadshow background music. And thank you for noting how long the project takes to complete. I often think that I'm taking way too long to build a project since online, it seems to only take a moment. So a couple of things here. One, the, the Antiques Roadshow uh, music comment cracked me up. I literally laughed out loud at that. So thanks for the laugh with that. To kind of give you an idea of what I do when I'm setting up a video, I try to match the music to the content. So if we're doing a pirate journal, I like to have like pirate music or ship sounds or something like that. Same thing for high fantasy, like we're, we just released a Celtic video, I believe, and we've got Celtic music behind that. Sometimes it sounds good in my head, but when it comes out the other end and you listen to it, it can come across like antique roadshow music apparently. So sorry about that. I wouldn't, have, if I'd have thought it sounded like antique roadshow, I definitely wouldn't have put it in there. But uh, that's kind of the strategy behind the music. As far as the project taking too long, so a couple of things. You mentioned that it seems to only take a couple of minutes when you're watching the video online. So some of my projects can really, they can last a long time. Um, and I have to cut them down so that it's a watchable length. I literally sometimes will have uh, four to eight hours worth of video to work through, and I have to cut that down into a length that's watchable for you. So please don't think that I'm rushing through these things in a couple of hours or something like that. These projects, they take time to get them done right, and that's what I want you to do. So please don't ever look at it and think, man, I am way too slow at this. The project takes as long as the project takes to get it right. I am much more concerned about the results that we create and whether or not you got the look you were going for than I am how long it took. So don't worry about that. And I will try to make sure that the music doesn't sound like the Antiques Roadshow going forward. Good question though. Thanks for the laugh. So our next question comes from Mr. Unclean One. 
and it says, why two coats of contact cement? This seems excessive, excessive and wasteful. So this was when we did the, uh, the journal or the book where we glued them together. And if you haven't worked with contact cement before, I totally get how it, if you're putting that on there, it looks like you're putting way too much on there and it's just excessive. The first coat really is just gonna prime the surface because the back of leather is so absorbent and it, sometimes it can be a little fuzzy. That first coat, all it does is glue down the fibers and give you a surface you can work with. The second coat is what creates the adhesion. So that's why we wanna put two coats on there almost every time. An easy way to tell if you need two coats is just to take the back of your finger like your knuckle and tap it like that and if that glue's not grabbing a hold of your finger, then you need to put a second coat on there. But that's why we do it, just because we want to prime it with the first coat, create the adhesion with the second coat. Good question. So our last question of the day comes from Pamela Manaton. I hope I said that right. 8475, it says, thank you for the great videos. This came from the, uh, the must have tools video that we did a little while back. Thank you for your great videos. Sometimes I'd really like to see how you organize your stamps at your workbench tried several layouts, but it would, would be helpful to get some feedback on how to make it better. So a lot of the common ways that you're gonna see people do it is a, a wooden block. In fact, I have one right back here. I don't know if you can see it past me or not, but there's a wooden block back there. I've got that. The, the place that I keep most of my tools, the ones that I use on every single project is right off to my left right here. And before I show it to you, I'll tell you what kind of in inspired this. That is a tool roll. A lot of times you'll see a tool roll where people have all their tools in it. Chefs use this a lot. And then they roll it up and they tie it off. And what you end up with is this roll that's about this big around. It's like carrying a volleyball around with you. This thing is bulky and it's hard to transport. I used to go up and tool with a bunch of friends and hang out with them. So I would carry my stuff up there. Well, that big old volleyball that weighs about five pounds with all those tools in it, that's kind of hard to tote around with you. So what I came up with, and I'm not saying it's original to me, it's just I, I put this together, some other people have probably done the same thing. What I came up with is this tool envelope. And the reason I call it an envelope, well, one, it kind of looks like an old world kind of envelope. I can tie it off if I need to, which I do when I'm traveling. It opens up, let's see if I can do this, and then it folds out. So. So that's what it looks like when it's unfolded. Then I can fold this back, and what you end up with is this nice little sleeve, kind of like a tool roll that has everything in it that I need. I've got my swivel knife, I've got all my major stamps that I use in every project, and they're right there. They have the same spot that they go in every single time, and it lays off to the side of my project right here off to my left. And if I'm going to go somewhere, let's say I'm teaching at a show or something, this packs up really easy because it's so flat. But that's what I like to do. So that's going to do it for this video. I will see you in the next one. In the meantime, go make something amazing.